The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight, those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one. Um, if you'd like to uh, listen, you can come over to Para-X, uh, radio Network.com and uh, join in the uh, live chat. And you'll be right here with us, so we appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we've got a great show lined up and great guest. And uh, we have with us Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And we got Tabby Cat. How you doing, everybody? And we got Jeffrey Gould. Hello. All right. Now, before you introduce the guest... Uh, I guess uh, we're pretty much ready. We got a whole lot to to cover too, or try anyway. So, um, Barbara, you've been doing good out there. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, you know, north of us, as it was a terrible heat wave, and we got a bunch of fires already. But wow. And, and Jeff, you're doing good there in the south. Yeah, we've been having uh, 70s to 80s, but we've been having nice breezes each day, so it kind of cuts it uh, down a bit. Yeah, that's about like us here. Uh, it's supposed to start getting really warm tomorrow and possible storms, too. So uh, with that, why don't you introduce our guest? Okay, well, tonight's guest is George Lunsford. He's the author of the four-volume book series, Legends, Myth monsters and ghosts uh, with which to share the stories he's heard and research from all over the world, which is a smart move on his point, considering all of mine are just right on my website. A fellow actor, uh, George has been living an impressive paranormal filled life from his childhood experiences of his then recently passed great grandmother visiting is having uh, had a near death experience attending a haunted high school, a UFO encounter in the Bermuda Triangle and many other events. George has always had a lifelong interest in and researching the uh, paranormal at large. So welcome, welcome, George Lunsford. Uh, thank you very much. Now, you've been to a lot of places and done a lot of stuff, actually, before you wrote the book. Um, now, that was, that was compliments to the United States Navy. <laughs> oh, let's see, I was in the Air Force, and I only hey, got to go but, one yeah. place. <laughs> Jeff dropped a bombshell, and we got to we got to talk about this. A UFO, and you made it into the Bermuda Triangle and out again. Many times. Wow. <laughs> Some interesting. Hopefully, not everybody gets sucked up into it. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> With my luck, I would. No, not happening. Uh, so I explain your Bermuda Triangle experiences. Which one? <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> oh, all of them. Because to me, you know, it's like wow. You know, just to be in there must have been uh, creepy at first. It really, when you're out there, it's no different than any rest of the ocean. But it, you do have strange happen. We found one one time. We found a F-14 tail fin floating in the water. <gasps> we go and we recover the F-14. Fan, fin, we pull it up, and it looks like on the edges, there was no jagged edges. It looked like it had been laser cut. It was just smooth around the edges and everything else, and there was very few barnacles like it was set there for us to find. Wow. wow. And now, there's no like numbers on there that you can pick up exactly which plane it was, is there? Yeah, they had some ID numbers on the top part of the tail fin. They run it, and it had disappeared. Several years before we found it. Wow. The whole plane? Yeah. 
Uh, you know, we just got to wait five and a half years for the passengers to pop back in. Oh, wait, no, that's a... Uh, was oh, a pilot missing two? That's a reference to a, an excellent TV show that unfortunately has just been canceled. I'm not uh, happy about it. What show is it? Huh? Uh, Manifest. Oh, Manifest. yeah. So did uh, did the uh, pilot survive, George? Yeah, from what I understand, the pilot and the co-pilot had ejected. It was doing a training mission, and they ejected and were picked up, but their plane was lost. Huh. Wow. Okay. They didn't have any explanation as to how that thing could have gotten sheared off like that? I, I don't understand it, because there should be some jagged edges on it, and I didn't see any jagged edges on it. It, was, it looked like you had literally laser cut it off the plane. Huh. Well, could that have happened from, like, lightning or something? No, they should be. If, if it was ripped off a plane like that, they should have been some type of jagged edges on it. I mean, metal doesn't rip that smoothly. Oh. Wow. And then the, real, the fun one... The really interesting one was uh, I was on aft lookout. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. I mean, the water was just as smooth as glass. It was sunny. It was just a gorgeous, gorgeous day. We was watching the bottlenose dolphins run around and play and the porpoises and all that. And in front of the ship, you could see like a little dot on the horizon, like a little gray dot. And as we got closer, of course, it got bigger and bigger. When we got up to it, it was a fog bank that went from water all the way to the sky, as high as you could see, and as far as you could see in both directions, east and west. As the ship started going into the fog bank, all the electronics shut down, and the uh, the uh, compasses and everything started spinning crazy, like electrical. I mean, like magnetic. It started spinning out of control. And we had so much inertia behind the ship was moving without, you know, even with no power, we're still moving forward. So as the ship went in, all that started, started happening. But when it come out the other side of the fog bank, as each ship, each part of the ship come out, everything kicked back on normal. Huh. And as you went through it, I was on that lookout. So as it was going through it, it, you could feel electrical charge on your skin and the hair would stand up and it just felt kind of weird. You know what I mean? I've heard of those uh, down in the Bermuda Triangle like that. Huh? I said, I've heard of those in the Bermuda Triangle like that. People seeing those clouds like that. The fog. It's, it's weird. And it really is. And then after the ship went all the way through the fog bank, the water was choppy and it was kind of a grayish day. Look back and there was no fog bank. Really? Wow. Sorry. And, and then, yeah, people wonder why the Bermuda Triangle has such a reputation it does, and it's stuff like that. That I mean, I, I, it didn't pick up on the radar at all either? No. Wow. Hmm. Wow. This, okay, where did it happen, you know? So what uh, type of ship was you on? I was on a fast frigate guided missile, an FFG. Hmm. The same <laughs> USS Stark and USS Robinson was. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, and, and nobody disappeared off the ship, right? No, no. Everybody's <laughs> accounted for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the start of a Twilight Zone story if there ever was one. <laughs> I could probably build on that and make a story out of it. could, very. <laughs> well, now, I, I remember... Uh, the story about the ships in Philadelphia where they made uh, one disappear. But when it come back, uh, it was kind of like messed up and the people was kind of like weaved into the metal and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that you've that heard it. Eldridge. But, but, the, but, yeah, the yeah. Eldridge. Did, did yep. you ever get any kind of uh, secret confirmation that something like that happened? Oh, no. They did, I was just a poor, lonely old gunner's mate. They didn't care what I thought. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Only time they wanted me is when they wanted me to shoot something. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That would have been a fascinating thing to 
to actually research. You know, and not too many people are willing to talk about that particular incident. And you it's, can't, it's, they're like game. trying not to not to admit that it happened or something. They've tried to deny it, and it's all part of. Uh, I believe that they said that's part of their. They're trying to develop some kind of a cloaking device, so they yeah. could cloak ships so they wouldn't be picked up on radar or visually. Yeah, something True. that went horribly wrong. Yep. Yeah, so, even, even Nikola Tesla dropped the project saying, uh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, Did you know, you were down it? there in the Caribbean. Um, any pirates down there? <laughs> I mess with our boat. <laughs> <laughs> My boat was 353 yeah. feet long, so no. <laughs> what? No, Jack Sparrow? <laughs> no, no. Nobody flying the pirate flag. That's too bad. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I did enjoy the Caribbean. Though. I have to. That loving you can stand on the deck and look in the water and see, you know, yeah. twenty down, just as clear as a bell. Wow. It's amazingly clear water and amazingly warm. Uh, nice to swim in. Oh yeah, we did. We did a couple of uh, swim calls on the ship when we were down there a few times. Did you encounter encounter any ghost ships? Uh, not necessarily just in the uh, the Caribbean, but anywhere as while you were aboard ship, did did you guys ever encounter, or did you hear of anybody encountering any kind of ghost ships or something you couldn't explain out on the water? Not really. I mean, uh, from what I've been reading about the ghost ships, that's kind of a hit and miss thing. It's it usually involves a timing like at the time when the ship actually sunk is when it reappears, almost like a glitch in time. Uh -huh. I haven't really heard much about, no, I was in the Navy at least, about all that. In my research, I did. A lot of them in the uh, Great Lakes. Yeah, that that's probably got some of the most interesting stories up there. Have you uh, gone up there to the to the Great Lakes area and investigated any of those sightings? Uh, no, unfortunately, I hadn't had the money or the time. I, I'm where I work a regular full time job, too. so oh, I might be on your bucket list then. <laughs> that last week when we was up in uh, Chicago. Actually, today is the anniversary of the uh, St. Lawrence uh, Seaway opening up oh, wow. uh, connecting um, all the ships to the ocean so. that's cool I did not know that oh well it, since they're doing that the, uh, you know since they did that I can't help but wonder if that's why you keep seeing all of these sightings and reports and everything of all these sea monsters in the Great Lakes you know now that they're more connected to the to the ocean you know, all the sightings that they claim um, of seeing big, huge critters. But they say, oh, no, they can't live in, in fresh water. You know, they, these were, you know, sea creatures uh, out in the ocean. And every time they find some sort of a connection uh, between l large bodies of water like the Great Lakes and things like that to the ocean, or like even Loch Ness, you know, there's got to be something to it. You, got to figure that sooner or later look at the bull shark it can go from salt water to fresh why couldn't it, something it else there, yeah well you know i think that they're they look at things through a certain prism i mean they look at them like okay this can't happen because of this and i got a news for them nature can do whatever nature wants to you're not going to change it yeah i think that's that's the one constant in there is in the world and there's no reason why these creatures couldn't live in salt water and fresh water. Uh, somebody just took a video of an uh, octopus coming out of the water and grabbing food. Oh, I believe it. So, yeah. yep. They're pretty intelligent. Why not? They know, oh, yeah. they know when they've got a handout. <laughs> yeah. Or a tentacle out. Yep. <laughs> uh we have a question from the chat room from Sherry, and she wants to know, do you know anything about some of the plane crashes that are in the Great Lakes? You know, the, uh, the, the strange ones, like, you know, when that, the, the, what was it, the Senator and a few others that disappeared in the Great Lakes, all the, 
controversy and so forth up there? No, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about it. I have heard and I have read that there are storms and there is magnetic issues up there that, that can mess with aircraft. Yeah. About there, I've never really researched. Well, there well, are... down in your area too, there there's a lot of rock anomalies too that would uh, account for some crashes and weird lights going on, etc. Oh yeah, we got we got. Road, you can look over to Brown Mountain, and there's lights pop up and move across the mountain. Have Have you got to see those? I have many times. Mm -hmm. Any any theory or any uh, idea as to what you think it might be? Well, there's different stories about it. There's some saying that it was a, a lost child and the parents were out looking for the child with a the lantern. There's stories that it was a escaped slave before the Civil War trying to find the slave. Uh, there's all kinds of different stories. I personally believe that it's a real holy in the Cherokee uh, to have holy stories about that mountain. So I don't I wouldn't be experience this moving around the mountain. Wow. We asked when I was young. We had people we broke the mountain up into fields on a map. We had some people some people report to the ones on the over on the mountain and they'd try to get to it before it disappeared. What color is the light? Uh, yellow. I've seen white. And I think that's the only two colors I've seen personally. Okay, so it does look more like a, like a flame of some sort rather yeah. than, you know, the blue lights like a lot of people see. Yeah. So it does look like fire of some sort. It does. It looks like a burn or something through there. Yeah. And you seem to be breaking up for some reason. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault. It's just I think it's the way the connection is. Um, do you have a microphone on your headset? No, I'm actually using my phone. My computer's not acting right. Ah, your phone. Well, that's that's probably why then. Phones usually do that, so. I'm very sorry. Oh, that's all right. No problem, no problem. That, that's something that happens. <laughs> Generally, it happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with all the various different places that you've been, um, your books cover... So, uh, you know, a wide range of subjects, you know, they go from, you know, ghosts to witches to um, strange creatures to cryptids and so forth. Now, the, the majority of the stories that you do, George, um, it pretty much encompasses the, the general area where you've been and are right now in the United States, but you do have some that are out in... Uh, the West and so forth, like where Barbara and Jeff are right now. Is there anything in particular out there, say in California or in that general area, that you find the most fascinating? Well, Bigfoot, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm a Bigfoot fan, big time. And in my in the book for California, I talk about the bushwhacker monster, the lizard people, and the Frisco Nightwalkers. Yeah, problem. what is what are they? What are they supposed to be? People believe they're aliens because what? they have no body. It's just a head and legs. They believe that oh, they're aliens. Those, those weird white, like they're like almost look like weird stick figures with the sweatpants kind of yep. look. Yep. Oh, I love that! I love that clip. That keeps showing on a lot of the compilation uh, stuff. I keep thinking, even if it was fake, who would do this and why? You know, I, I'm sorry. I still think they're baby barn owls. <laughs> <laughs> no, serious. Have you ever seen a baby barn owl? Oh yeah. They look like that. Yeah, long legs, no feathers, and they walk like that. Yeah, so. they, they 
Yeah, but yeah. they're wearing. They don't look like they're wearing sweatpants and stick. We say them. These guys don't even have talent. They're just like, they're like they're on stilts or something almost. Yeah. They're not. They're supposed to be like six feet tall or something like that. Yeah, that'd be a, cute. <laughs> that would be a big Darnell. Yes. Oh my goodness. Wow. And I didn't know they had a name. What What did you call them? Go night crawlers. Night crawlers. Isn't that a worm? Yeah. <laughs> it is. That's what, that's what got me confused. <laughs> and don't Go call it Frisco. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, searching for night crawlers with my dad for him to take fishing, and he we'd be out there in the middle of the, you know, the night with flashlights and everything, and. He would never find him with his flashlight, but I would always find him with my bare feet. <laughs> I never <laughs> liked that. Oh, Lord. Now, beside, what was the other one? Uh, there's the Billy Whack Monster. The Billy Whack Monster. What is that? I don't remember that one too well. Okay. It way too much. <laughs> Well, Bigfoot, I already know about, but yeah. uh, there's a lot of that here. Well, there's there's so many things. Probably one of the things that I had never really heard of, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of things in your books, George, that some of the references and everything I've never heard of. They have some really interesting names and so forth. But one that I thought was really interesting in South Carolina was a boo hag. Oh, the boo hag. I love the boo hag. I had never heard of that before. That actually um, was told to me when I was young by the the Gullah people. The, I, call them, I always call them the Gullah. But they're, they're, uh, they were actually brought here from West Africa. And they tell stories from, you know, that was handed down in their native area. And that was one of the, one of the, Legends that they talked about was the boo hag. Wow. Aren't they supposed to be some form of witch? Well, it's it's kind of an odd creature. The boo hag is a it's almost like a demon type character, but what it does is it, it wires human skin during the day, and it moves around like everyone else. And at night time, it'll shed its skin. And turn into its, uh, I guess you're a true, a, a strural form, or whatever you call it. And it goes into other houses, and it goes to people that are asleep, and it gets up on top of them and steals their life force so that it can live. Wow. And for daylight, it has to be back at its place and back in its skin. Hmm. You know, that sounds an awful lot. Some of the, like some of the um, paintings and etchings and everything that I used. To, saw from back in the uh, 15 and 1600s, even here in the United States back then, where you, they would show this really ugly looking thing literally on top of somebody in bed yep. with, you know, dripping looking skin. But that was, you know, long before the Civil War. But there has to be some sort of basis for that. I mean, it, for it to, you know, go in between all of these different cultures and, you know, different formats and everything. So there's got to be something to it. I mean, I guess it's sort of like the boogeyman that we're always you oh, know, yeah. being told, hey, you know, the boogeyman's going to get you if you don't mind yourself. Well, the thing about <laughs> thing about the boo hag, the boo hag is kind of like a, a neurotic creature. It's kind of nuts because there's three ways to stop a boo hag. You can pour salt around your bed, which is messy. Yeah, well, that's the typical witch thing. You, you keep witches at bay with salt. You can put indigo paint on your trim work around your doors and your windows. It can't cross it. Or, my favorite one, you can put like a broom or a, or a, a duster in your bedroom, and the boo hag can't resist if it comes in your room and that broom's there. It has to count. The, the pieces of the of the broom. Well, that's also a, a way to stop vampires because that's supposed they're supposed to be OCD. You put rice, oh, like a little pile of rice at your doorstep, 
and they're counting it until the sun comes up and then they're destroyed. Yep, exactly. That's wow, right. yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely well, OCD. Get... Wow. I was hoping you were saying that they'd have to pick up the broom and clean your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara wants to invite one. <laughs> well, now, how did you get started into researching all these? Well, I remember growing up, what it was when I, grew, when I grew up, your grandparents or your parents used to hand down stories to you about your area. Like they told us about a thing called Helen's Bridge. They told us about the Brown Mountain Lights and all these other different stories from our area. And as a kid, you know, growing up, you, st you hear these stories, you have to go check them out. You know, because yeah. we're crazy as youngins and we have nothing better to do. So we would go wherever we heard about these stories about, we'd go investigate them and check them out just to see what was going on with them. And Nowadays, we don't really have that. We don't have older people telling stories down to the younger people and, you know, getting their imagination built up and getting them excited to go check out stuff around their own areas. And I wanted to pass that on. I really did. I, I, I didn't want that to be lost. That's, that's great. I, I think that is probably something that is really lost is storytelling. Uh, you know, you've got the Internet. You've got cable and but nobody really just sits around and talks about folklore their past and everything else it's it seems to be a lost art and it's it's a shame it really is because these stories are born in these areas i mean they're not i mean some of them may overlap they may be things like them other places but the stories that were handed down were the history of where you where you're hearing them at and it's just something that's being lost, and I, I couldn't stand it. I, I don't I'm, – I'm weird. I'm kind of OCD in some ways, I guess. I don't want to lose that because I still tell my kids stories. And my kids are in their 20s. So have you been to any of these places to research them? Some of them I have. A lot of them I couldn't go to because my books cover the entire United States. Right. But yeah. like when I was doing – uh, North Carolina, and I did, and the very first part of that book, my very first book, was the first chapter was about the Cherokee legends. Right. Well, I worked in Cherokee every month. So I was out there around Cherokee, and I would ask around the people out there. And I would go, I got a lot of the stories and stuff from them. It's like, I, I talk about like uh, the Sukaloo. Well, the Sukaloo is the Cherokee Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I heard his story. And the cool thing I found out is everybody else that tell, passes down these stories, there's variations. But if you go to the Indian tribes, there's no variations in their stories. It's passed down exactly the same every time it's passed down. Yeah. Hmm. Which is incredible to me. The fact that they pass their stories down exactly the same to each generation. And they still, they're, they still sit around in Cherokee and tell the stories and tell about the legends like Spearfinger or the little people or uh, the Raven mocker or Sukulu. They still tell all those stories out there to their young. Yeah. Wow. And great. I'll, 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 I just love it to them. I think it's awesome. I think the Raven mocker was probably one of my favorites out of that particular chapter. Um, because uh, the raven mocker, they refer to it almost as a, you know, like a, a, a shape shifter type of thing. But uh, the fact that it is a, you know, what I would refer to as almost a harbinger of death sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And it, there, just about every culture in the world has got something similar to it. Like the Irish have the banshee. Oh, yeah. So... The Cherokee have the the raven mocker, but the raven, uh, the the bird, the raven, isn't the only form that it takes, is it? No, it's not. It can take on any form, whether it be an old person, a kid, just really anything it takes to get to the person that is passing away. Yeah. And it just seems to be that those that are 
actually going to die. In other words, it, it, they're not there to take your life. They're right. there to make the transition? Yeah. Okay. That's the way I understood it, yes. Wow. Well, the thing I found most interesting in the Cherokee, of course, Spearfinger was one of my favorites because, I mean, come on, she, she's got skin of rock. You just got to love her, even though she does eat children's livers, but still, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give her a break. She just eats you know. yeah, I mean, onions. Yeah, you know, just give her a break. But uh, the whole story of Spearfinger is fantastic. But what I found the most interesting is when I was doing this research in Cherokee, there was a lady who had written a book, and I happened to run across it and also found it online. And she talks about the little people. Well, I got me curious, so I started talking to the people out there in Cherokee about the little people. And I got to talk to an older gentleman out there. He was probably in his 80s. And he was telling me about when they were doing construction out there in Cherokee that they found some of the bones of the little people and some of their tunnels. Wow. Oh, my word. Hmm. Wow. Of course, I eat that up, you know. I'm a big derb when it comes to all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, every everything has its basis in fact. And I mean, True. it's just like, you know, the giants that they seem to find in Europe and everything. Yeah. You know, why not? You know, heck, we've got people right now, we've got basketball players that are huge. And if you go to England right now, I think it's in the, the Tower of London um, Museum, they have, uh, and I, I saw it with my own eyes, a um, full suit of armor for somebody that was darn near seven feet tall. And then oh, yeah. right next to it was a suit of armor for somebody who was only three feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when the, when the Indians come over the land bridge into America, they talked about, in all their legends from all the ones out west all the, ones, all the way to the east coast, they talked about running into the white giants. And they described them as having red hair or uh, green eyes. Hmm. They attacked them because they they could, they were uh, cannibals. So the Indians attacked them, and they you know they talk about them as if they wiped them out. But we won't get into all that though because. Uh, <laughs> <that's, that's, laughs> well, I mean that that is a legend. I mean. I, even in uh, some scholars are saying that came from Europe that there were uh, groups that came in and that there's supposedly some, I believe, Cherokee legends of seeing people with very light skin and blue eyes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that there were probably a lot of visitors to North America prior to uh, 1492. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you a little teaser here. So what you think. You know, the disappearance of the giants in America and the reappearance of the wild men were around 200 years, 300 years. And it, it was all around what they call the mammoth cave system. Uh, in Kentucky? Oh, man. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that opens up a whole can of worms. <laughs> oh yeah, it does. Oof. Well, we won't we won't go into the goblins. <laughs> <laughs> That's another big one there, the Hopkinsville go goblin stuff. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, with all Which of I the. Which I believe uh, is cave related, right? Yeah, you know are goblins? Yeah, goblins all over. Uh, you know, in any kind of folklore, are involved in caves. Well, they're especially around, in go Bob, ahead. up in uh, Iceland and all that, they're big up there. Wow. Goblins and holes. So, do they all come out then on Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see, I was married to one of my second marriage. Oh, so. Lord. Oops. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> well, now I was then, gonna say I dated a troll or two, but yeah. Well. 
Uh, in North Carolina, uh, down in Wilmington, uh, had you ever heard of the uh, Chamber of Commerce building down there being haunted? Any stories I have. On it? I was actually invited, but was unable to go to a ghost hunt down there. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to go to the one on USS North Carolina, too. I've oh, been, did you? Oh, that's I did. so cool. Yeah. I was unable to go. I was uh, on the North Carolina many times, being able to just walk around and and just look at everything. I mean, because I lived, I lived right there in Wilmington for 20 years, so I was doing stuff like that. I wasn't into the paranormal at the time, but uh, the, the ship itself was fascinating. So, but oh, it there, is. There, there, there was uh, in the Chamber of Commerce building, there's not, it's not the Chamber of Commerce anymore. Uh, it was an old house set up on uh, Gallows Hill where they used to hang the people at uh, when they deemed them to be hanged. And right. so it was named uh, Gallows Hill. But, but there was this house there that they had made into the Chamber of Commerce building. Uh, shortly, I don't know, a couple months after I'd moved to Wilmington, uh, my mom sent me this fate magazine uh, talking about the Chamber of Commerce building and this guy had took a picture of a ghost coming down the stairway, which naturally I'm going to go there just to talk to the people and see if anything happened. Uh, I did go in and talk with them, and they said that um, they had never seen anything other than sometimes the uh, back door would just open up. It'd be locked, but it would just open up. Uh, other than that, they, they didn't really see anything. So I let, it, cool. I let it go at that. Um, my wife at the time was working for this woman, taking care of her mother while she worked. And when she come home one day, my wife was telling her about the Chamber of Commerce building, and we would went down there, and this fate magazine had a picture of a ghost. She told her, she said, wait just a minute. She went in her bedroom and come out with the original 8x10 glossy picture of that ghost on the stairway. At the time, she was dating or going with the guy that actually took the picture. Oh, that's cool. Now, is that coincidence? I mean, so uh, I thought it was real neat, something like that. And, and she said it was all true. So, Oh, I, I don't doubt it at all. I really don't. Anytime there's something traumatic happens in the area, I think that creates the ghost. Well, now have you uh, personally seen, you know, with your own eyes, uh, an apparition or something that you really can't explain or probably considered to be a ghost? Oh, yeah, several times. And where was that? Well, when I'm like I said, like in my book, it tells about it was uh, my great grandmother was the first one. Uh, she would come in and sat on the end of my bed and I woke up and she was there and it didn't look right the more my eyes got focused she looked translucent but she had all regular form and she told me goodbye and that she loved me she just vaporized away mm. but what made me know it was really her you know how everyone has a certain scent like soap or perfume or whatever you smell right. you, you, that scent well that scent was in my room when I woke up, it was still in my room. Huh. Then, then she had passed away. So she came to you to say goodbye. Yeah. Oh, that really was cool. nice. That's yeah. great. Now, we were talking a little bit about banshees before, and um, you mentioned in one of your books about a, the white screamer. Yep. Which kind of sounds almost the same as a banshee in, in a way. Yeah. It does. It kind of is. It kind of is, yeah. It's a little bit it's more of an American version of a banshee, I guess you could say. Well, there, uh, there's an awful lot of Scottish people that um, uh, settled in uh, Tennessee and Kentucky in that area, right? So I, I'm guessing that it's probably an offshoot of that. I'm, I'm thinking so, yeah, because everything gets 
like I said, everyone else can pass down these stories and they get changed a little bit with each story, except for the Indians. They, they don't change their stories at all, but everybody else does. So <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it is probably pretty close to the, the original story of the Banshee. I think it's probably the same thing as the watch. So that's, yeah, that's a really wild, uh, it's almost like a mist. Yep. Now, when, when I lived uh, in Daytona, uh, before I went into the service, they, uh, you had, you had one in there about the devil chair. Uh, it's in Volusia County. Uh, yeah. I had never heard of that until I read it in your book here. And, uh, I thought if I ever make it back down there again, I guess I'll have to go out there and look. But what uh, what's supposed to happen uh, with the devil's chair? If you go out there and sit in it or something like that, does it come out and grab you? <laughs> well, honestly, it's been a while since I wrote that one, so I don't remember a lot of the details. Uh, it seems like when I wrote that, it's been four years. <sighs> I don't think that you actually said in gravity. If I remember right, people saw the devil sitting in it. Oh, really? Oh. Uh. Wow. If I remember, I said it's, it's been it's been about four years since I wrote that, so I don't really. It's not one of the ones that actually stood out as much as some of the other ones did. Right. I thought it was a story, but it didn't it didn't have that pizzazz that some of the other stories had. So they were they were seeing like a devil with horns and what have you, or what? Yeah. Wow. Sitting on his throne. <laughs> the scepter. You're next. It didn't look like I'm from Lucifer, I guess. <laughs> uh. so did you come across a story uh, in Daytona about um, the Tomoka Light? I saw it, but I couldn't get enough good information on it at the time to give it to do it justice when I put it on paper. So if I if I can't do them as much justice as possible, I won't put them in a book because yeah, well, I felt doing a disservice to the people of that area. I've uh, I've been there and many nights driving up and down that road, and yes, I've seen it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That what one, do they relate to? They'll. It's like a, a three mile stretch of road from the last street light to the. Uh, park entrance and um, it's swamp on both sides so you can't pull off the road and the road has overhanging trees all the way through it uh, so that makes it spooky but you drive up and down that road slow and turn your headlights off and on and all of a sudden the light will come on either in front of you or behind you it'll start coming at you fast changing colors changing shapes and uh, I've known it to like go out behind you and then come back on in front of you and different things like that. Uh, a lot of people get killed chasing it out there or running from it, one of the two. Uh, but I never uh, did anything like that, run fast or anything. <laughs> but I, yeah. I did see it one night. I mean, it turned a red and big shape. And I mean, it was coming down the road. So we left that area then. We didn't go back for a long time. Well, isn't, aren't a lot of that things uh, actually explained as swamp gas? That's what they try and say it is. But you don't see it out in the, off the road. It's only on the road, so. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I read something about them seeing full body apparitions at the, at the cemetery. Uh, I don't remember that. I just, for some reason, that popped in my head just now. I, I know uh, there's one somewhere about uh, a cemetery down there, but uh, it's not in Tomoka. Uh, okay. I may have confused with something else. I've, I've, like I said, I've studied so much of this stuff, it's all kind of run together in my poor old warped brain. Well, usually, usually there's not much traffic on that road because it, at night uh, the road goes out through the jungle, you might say, going to Benel. And uh, so you don't you don't see a lot of traffic on it. 
uh, I'm sure it's built up more now because this was, I don't know, back in the early 60s. Uh, but uh, I remember one time uh, I was in the Boy Scouts and a couple of the guys wanted to take a hike uh, to get a 20-mile merit badge. And we was living in Harbor Oaks at the time. So we hiked all the way up to up to the park and uh, went to go in to the campground. And they said, if you ain't got your scout master, you can't stay here. So it was getting dusk by then. And it was another three miles back to the town. And there wasn't no way at night we was going to be doing that. So about halfway there, you have a, a rock sign uh saying tomoka state park and uh you can there's a little road right there it goes right down to the river and it's only about like 50 25 50 yards off the road and uh so we decided we would stay there and pitch our sleeping bags and just spend the night and but it was dead quiet out there there was nothing on the little road or anything and all of a sudden heard like about six kids on bicycles pedaling real slow on the road and i never said anything but one of the guys said hey let, let's jump up there and, and scare them so we jumped out of sleeping back put our shoes on run up to the road and look back toward the town nothing look back toward the park entrance nothing and there was nothing there and the swamp there was no place for them kids to go to so i wow. looked back I looked back toward town there, and I seen a red light come on, started coming down the road, and went into a rectangle, and I started hollering at the guys, there's a light, there's a light, and they just stood there dumbfounded. So we ended up running back down to the edge of the river and stood there for about an hour and never seen anything go by, never seen cars or anything. So we finally got brave enough to get our sleeping bags and, and get in for the night, but never did see anything. But it was, pretty cool. it was weird that you would hear kids. I mean, you could plainly hear them just slowly pedaling and talking and yeah. run right to the road, and there wasn't nothing nowhere. Goodness. Yeah. Now, George, since you are uh, most definitely a uh, fan of Bigfoot um, <laughs> and, you know, having traveled and everything a great number of places here in the United States – um, do you find that there's any particular state, in, in, discluding out west, because, you know, that's kind of uh, obvious that that's pretty much where a lot of the Bigfoot sightings are. Is there any place in your area in particular that have been known to have seen either Bigfoot or something similar to it? Uh, he's been seen here a lot. I live in Appalachia. So, and... He's actually he's been seen recently here. Really? Uh, high school over in Murphy. He's been seen uh, in the road on the road between there's a road to take from Franklin to Murphy, and it's nothing but a mountain road that goes up. It's a highway. It goes up the mountain on one side and down the mountain on the other side. There's been sights of him crossing the road. There's been uh, yells, screams you hear at night. Uh, he sees. He makes his presence known here, that's for sure. Now, personally, you know, have you actually witnessed something that you would consider to be quote-unquote Bigfoot? No, that's one thing I have not done. I've seen ghosts, I've seen UFOs, and all kinds of weird stuff, but never a Bigfoot. Have you ever heard anything that you couldn't explain that, that was supposedly a Bigfoot? Uh the funny thing is when you're out in the mountains at night, you're going to hear all kinds of stuff. And some of the creatures you don't think can make a, that kind of noise, like a fox. The fox will make the weirdest noise you've ever heard in your life. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you've got all the different birds and everything else. So I, I'm i not versed enough, even though I grew up in the mountains and you know stayed in them all my life as a kid. There's so many different noises out there. I can't really say, okay, that was a Bigfoot noise. Uh, well, now you've been, um, okay, out there where there's probably a little light pollution. Uh, how about UFOs? 
Uh, well, <laughs> what's, what's really weird when you say that is, is me and my wife are coming back from uh, Illinois uh, last week, last Friday. And as we was coming back, we were up about 37,000 feet. Beautiful outside, you know, the, the clouds are down below us. And my wife seen something. And it was a silver cylindrical object. And you couldn't see any wings, you couldn't see any jet exhaust, nothing. It was just an object in, in, out in the sky. So she showed me, and she reached down to get her camera to take a picture of it through the window of the airplane. And it disappeared. Wow. That was her first one she had seen. But we've seen, we see lights and stuff in the sky, but around here, it's go with it really is. Because you we've seen the uh, Lynx satellites that were put up by um, Elon Musk. We've seen uh, drones a lot, because everybody loves to play with drones around here. And different things like that, but nothing I can say around here that I've seen in the sky. Just in the middle of the ocean. That's mm -hmm. the only place I've ever seen for sure. Besides, oh, you mean when you were out on the boat? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> and that would have been in the Caribbean area, right? That was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Whoa. Wow. So literally right there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at night. About two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock morning, something like that. And I'm on lookout because I spent a lot of time on lookout because I was a gunner's mate. And we seen something about if, if you're on a ship and you're looking out across the ocean, 10 miles is what the horizon is from where you're at. So it was out about approximately seven, eight miles. And we seen this light and it was just the regular white light to start out with. But then there was, like, it started a little, like, a line of lights started lighting up. And there's no ship out there that has a line of lights like that. And there was nothing on radar, nothing on sonar, nothing, period. And we were watching it, and this thing started moving back and forth, side to side, like it was scanning or looking for something. And it went back and forth and back and forth up a little bit down a little bit back and forth and then it stopped dead and it shot straight up in the air so fast you couldn't keep your eyes on it hmm. and it went back and forth for a good five minutes before it ever shot up in the air wow now how many people aboard ship saw it uh at least six okay now uh, did you report it or did you just talks amongst yourself and decide, well, maybe we better not say anything because they might throw us overboard. <laughs> well, back then you kind of keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. How many years ago was that? Oh, that was 88. Oh, okay. So oh, long before Starlink, long before a lot of the uh, ships were up there. Oh, yeah. You know, you were asking me about the full apparitions. I've got a funny story for you. We bought a ring doorbell. We put the ring doorbell on the door, which is on the porch. And then you've got, if you're on the porch, we have a big porch. So it's the middle bedroom and then the end bedroom, and then you're off the porch. We were sitting here one night. Our ring doorbell went off. We thought, what in the world? So my wife pulls it up on the phone. We're standing looking at it, and this... Apparition, I guess you could say, is just like a body-shaped smoke comes out of the middle bedroom and stops in the middle of the porch. And the top of it pivots around like it's looking at the ring. It turned back around and went straight off the end of the porch, and we haven't seen it since. Wow. What kind of shape was it? Just uh... It was a amorphous shape. It really didn't have any features it was just long like a person and it had like a kind of a round top like like a head but you couldn't get any detail or any anything to tell what it was or anything so it was, it was just curious about what the heck was on your front porch 
Yeah, pretty much. Come out of the middle bedroom and went out the porch and left. Huh. Wow. How old is the house you live in? When was it built? Oh, well, the house was, our house was built in 74. Okay, 74? well, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, do you know if there was anything in particular on the property before the house was built, like a, a farm or anything like that? No, there, as far as I know, nothing's ever been here till we hmm. moved here. Now, there was a building. There is a building out here. It's 100 years old. So it's a little storage building. But that was the only thing here when we moved here. Wow. Now there's a, so the area still has some sort of a, an older history. So who yeah. knows could, who could have been out there? You know, because sometimes spirits get attached to the land. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And my house... When I was married to my first wife, that house, we had ghosts there. But the, when I did the research on the property where the house was, there had been a family lived there that had got wiped out by tuberculosis. And wow. they, oh, dear. And we had the ghost. The ghost inside the house was a 16, 17-year-old female. Oh, that's and sad. On the property was her mom and dad and her brother, her younger brother. Wow. You know, yeah, that is definitely sad. <clears throat> Whenever there is an illness or, uh, you know, a traumatic death, you know, that, that has a tendency to, to keep the energy there. Yeah. And it, it's well known that it doesn't make any difference even if there isn't a dwelling on the property. Yeah. If the land belongs to somebody that really loved that, that land, yeah. they might still roam there. Oh, I call her Bertha. But she was a sweetheart. When my kids were babies, like my my little my daughter was in her room crying one night. She was just an infant, and she was crying. I woke up to go check on her and change her diaper and stuff. I walk into the room, and all you hear is, "Oh!" And her blanket was like somebody was patting it. Oh, that's yeah, cool. She, she is big time. Yeah. But her little brother would mess with us. He'd run by the window. Maybe you'd get up out of your chair and you'd find out what was going on outside. Or he'd laugh in the middle of the night. <laughs> wow. Well, not all ghosts are bad. No, no, no. I've had great experience with some of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're not all Casper either, but, you know, they're... Uh, uh, most of them are just like your roommate that just never left. Well, from what I what I can tell, whatever personality they had alive is what they took with them when they were dead. Oh yeah, what yeah. They I, alive, they're a good person after they're dead. Yep. I've often told people that you know I I let them know you know just because you passed on doesn't mean a darn thing because if you were a jerk in life you were a jerk in death. Oh yeah. So if you go into a location to investigate. And you know this person is there, and this person is known to poke you, push you, scratch you, you know, slap you upside the head. I'm sorry, that's not a demon. It's just a person being a jerk in death, too. <laughs> wow. I'll agree with that. As long as Zach Baggins not with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're going to take us a quick break. Uh, be about five, six minutes. Just remember, your mic will be live, but you won't hear anything until we come back on. So, with that, um, I'm going to let uh, Jeff, if you give me a second, you can uh, take us out to break. So, take your time. How's that sound? Okay, you're listening to the Paranormal View on parahyphenx.com with your hosts, Henry Poister who's rattling buttons over on the side there, Ceiling Cab Barbara Duncan, Tabby Cat Gash, both of whom are felines apparently, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, more of a badger, and tonight's guest, fellow actor, George Lunsford. So stay tuned for more of the Paranormal View after the break. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal. Para X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. 
those listening here in the chat room and those listening from around the world, we appreciate all of you. I uh, want to welcome back uh, Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And speaking of listeners from around the world, where do we have listeners at tonight? Uh, all over the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Spain. All right. Spain. Spain. Good evening, Spain. <laughs> And we have with us uh, Tabby Cat. How you doing, everybody? And we have Jeffrey Gould. Hello. And we have our great guest with us tonight, George Lunsford. Hey, how y'all? Doing good. You? Doing pretty good for an old fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, talking about uh, some of the stories that's uh, in your books. Um, you had, uh, you had a couple ones that I kind of, uh, liked, uh, to get more information on. And let's see, I believe it was the, uh, in, in Alabama, Hugging Molly. Oh, okay. Okay. What, what do you want to know about it? I don't remember much about her. Oh, you don't? Uh, she, was, she was a young lady who passed away. Right. And, and I, I guess, uh, I forget what it was that was wrong with her, but she would come up behind somebody and hug them and then scream in her ear. She's actually a pretty friendly ghost Prior to some of them we wrote about in the book. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember how, what her age was. She's pretty young. She's pretty young. Let me, hold on just a second. Let me see what I can look at. I'll pull the book up and look at it. All right. I was four years ago. I had a hard time remembering. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, a lot of people suffer from CRS. We can't help it. <laughs> I know, it's terrible as you get older, it just kind of runs all over you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see here. Number nine. She was, she, I, my, my, still my favorite story, though, is still the one about Robert the Doll. Oh. I love yeah. oh, Robert. Oh, Robert. Yes. Yeah, we all like Robert. Can't help but like Robert. You see, nope. Robert has fans. He's he's not a bad doll at all. No, no, just strange. Okay. She hugged. I see a full She's about seven foot tall, heavy set woman, and she's dressed in black with a large brim hat, and she. Did we Oops. lose you? Apparently, she she lost her child and she was grieving. And that's what makes her want to hug kids and children. Hmm. Wow. She never hurts them. She never harms the children. Now, it's always very gentle, and uh, it's you know just a real nice thing when when it comes to children. She. I don't think she's quite as nice to older people sometimes. Right. Wow. So known to actually, uh, oh, been known to act scare big people, scare adults. Wow. Well, since you brought up Robert the doll. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Have you had a chance to visit it? No, I want to go so bad I can't stand it. But I am definitely <laughs> ask permission before I take a picture with him. Oh yeah, definitely do that. I have photographers who uh, friends who go down there and they keep trying to um, skirt that curse, but somebody always asks for permission before they can take a photograph. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that's that's polite. I mean, you do that, you know, anytime you're on an investigation, you, you go into a location. And if you want to take photographs, you know, me personally, especially if I'm on a location uh, like a Civil War battlefield or something, I always ask, would it be all right for me to take your image? You know, not a photograph. Could I take your image, please? It's, it's just polite. You know, you just ask them, you know, because some cultures don't like to have their photographs taken. That's some true. spirits don't like to have their photographs taken. So you ask for permission. It's just polite. That's true. That's true. I'll, I'll definitely agree with that. The thing about the Civil War, a lot of the uh, ghost, ghost ghost. I think it's more of a, a glitch in time. A battle has happened. A situation happened. That just stuck all the time. It repeats over and over and over and over again. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's not just a, a matter of being polite and everything. You've got to put, you know, your investigations in um, in perspective. You know, when you talk to uh, the spirits within a, a particular time frame, it's best to talk to them in um, the language and the vernacular and the slang and everything that they're familiar with. If you don't, they might not completely understand what you're talking about. Your mic seems to be breaking up again. Oh, sorry. Uh, How's that? That's better. Okay. All right. Uh, I know you had some uh, stories that I I kind of seemed interesting uh, in Louisiana, uh, and there's always creepy stuff in Louisiana. Uh, That's where I found. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's there's one about the uh, candy lady. What is she related to Sammy Davis Jr.? Oh no, I'm sorry. That's the Candy Man. <laughs> That's pretty close. You're going with Tony Todd, too. That's the other thing. I was going to say, yeah, Candyman is a whole nother little, yeah. <laughs> whole nother demon there. Close, though. I mean, I still got to give you credit. <laughs> Louisiana is full of fantastic stories. Yeah. I guess because there's just so much happened in there all the time. Yep. With a do mixture put in there and just the lifestyle in general down there, I think, creates a lot of uh, interesting characters. That's why I'm fat, because I'm married to a Louisiana girl, so. Oh. You know, Mary won't put New Orleans, you're going to get fat. That's just all there is to it. Well, they have, a like, a, a lot of witchcraft and stuff like that down there. Yeah, it's all the voodoo. They The voodoo yeah. come in from West Africa and up through the Caribbean and all that. And it's just, it's just that weird, you know, the whole thing. It's, it's a whole different kind of magic compared to like regular witchcraft and stuff. I mean, when people talk about vampires or ghosts or demons in Louisiana, you could actually believe it. No question. No, I, I think my favorite is the Luguru, which is, uh, you know, what anybody else would, uh, you know, translate to werewolf. Yeah. And th that to me is probably one of the creepiest that comes out of Louisiana, not just the voodoo, but the Luguru. Uh, because it, it's not quite the same thing as your, your typical werewolf. No, I said it dates all the way back to medieval France. And I mean, the glow of the eyes and everything kind of reminds you of that, but it's just a different kind of a character. It really is. Well, it's it must have something to do with, you know, the just the culture. You know, down south, you know, you've got the Spanish, you've got the French, and, and so forth. And they brought in a great number of their own uh, superstitions, their own stories and everything. 
but once they establish themselves, when you compare that to what the Scots and the Irish and the English brought in in the north, there are so many comparisons between the two. You, you have to wonder, there's got to be a common factor in there. Yeah, and the fact that it's because all of them were there together, and almost like it, they weave yourself in back and forth between the different cultures. So it makes a little bit of changes every time they weave it around. I mean, you got English parent, an English father, and a French mother. Then those, both of those stories combine when they tell them to their kids. And of course, the kids take those stories and they pass them on there. And they've got that mixture of the cultures going when they pass it down. So it gets changed a little bit more, and it gets changed a little bit more every time it's passed down because you do have that mix, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's got to be a basis, in fact, somewhere. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, down through the years, uh, you know, we've understood an awful lot of things uh, based on actual physiology and medical and so forth. It, it's like all of the people that have, I forget what the term is, but those that have an excess of hair. And, you know, they used to be in uh, circuses and sideshows and things like that, you know, like the wolf boy or whatever, okay. or the wolf girl or the bearded lady. And all of these people have this affliction. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. This medical condition that causes you to have all of this hair but, you know, people fear that. And it's like anybody that, um, you know, has, you know, a need to eat a lot of raw meat. They're going to be considered vampires. That sort of thing. So yeah. there is always a basis in fact. Oh, I, I agree 100%. Um, in Mississippi... Uh, let me see, is it Mississippi? Yes, Mississippi. Probably one of my favorites is the Robert Johnson story. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on that one? He uh, was a fair guitar player, and he wanted to do better, and he was willing to sell his soul to the devil. So the devil made him on the crossroads, made a deal with Robert Johnson to sell his soul to, to be famous and rich because he was a poor sharecropper son. He sold us, he signed the papers and overnight he become a incredible guitar player, singer, songwriter, rose to the top of his in the blues and rhythm and blues and then got poisoned by, by a jealous husband. Wow. Now, there, there is, you know, an awful lot of stories, you know, not only in Mississippi, but also all over the area about going to the crossroads and meeting up with the devil and selling your soul. Um, do you have any idea where that came from, that you have to meet in a, in a crossroads? Well, from what I understand, the the thing is, the devil always get, gives a choice. You can either take this road and not sign your soul up, and this is what's going to happen to you. Or you can take this road once you sign your soul over, and this is what's going to happen. So it's a choice you have to physically say, okay, this is what I want. And you okay. To, you know, and you're turned, and the devil makes you face the road that you want to take. Okay, but evidently, now. he's not a good fiddle player, so um, you can take your chances with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Charlie Daniels, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember seeing years ago a, uh, a film called Crossroads, and it had uh, Ralph Macchio in it, and I think Steve Vai was actually in that film, you know, playing the one that was, you know, in 
you know, down under with the devil and everything, that Machio ended up challenging him to a, a guitar duel and right. so forth. And it, it's really interesting, that, you know, that, that most people seem to think that when it comes down to the devil, you know, to uh, sell your soul for something worthy, something that you really want and everything, that there's always a trade-off that you might get what you want, but in the end, there's a trade-off. And that must have happened with Robert Johnson. He had all this fame for a very short period of time, but then, bam. Yep. And, you know, why was he, you know, and it seems kind of odd that with all the things that he went through, he got poisoned by a jealous husband? Yep, he had a... He had a uh, hate for uh, the ladies. Oh. It didn't matter if I was married or not. Yeah. Well, maybe it was either the devil or his bad choices. Right. And that could be the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. This could you know, be the, you know, the, the wrong The devil part. maybe do it sort of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, certainly gave him the blues. Oh, wait, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anybody that listens to Robert Johnson's music and, you know, my husband and I are both, you know, blues fans and listening to Robert Johnson from back then, he was not the biggest talent at that time. But when you listen to his music and when you listen to the way he sings and the way he plays, it's from the heart. And I think that's probably what the saddest thing was, is that he did that. He wanted that to be known. And if he did indeed sell his soul to the devil to have that kind of talent, yeah, it, w it was a sad thing because he traded off. Because yeah. had he lived, he probably would have changed the blues. Because, But in the end, the devil... I'm sorry, but, you know, Robert Johnson got the last laugh on him because so many blues players based their music and their talent on what he did. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. sorry yeah. about that, Lucifer. <laughs> wow. Well, I think the end goal, if Lucifer had an end goal, was just the acquisition of a soul. So, I'm sure he didn't mind whatever side issues or quests came up. Yeah, well, that's true, too. I mean, there's plenty because more. The more because the more successful other people, you know, the more tempted they are to get more. Yeah. So they could be better, you know, also clients. Right. Well, yeah, he opened it up for more people to come to him. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Networking. Did. Networking. Networking. <laughs> So we're going to start getting Instagram ads with the devil doing that, you know. I can show you in 15 seconds how you Make can read them through. <laughs> well, I found it funny because, you know, I, I have friends in Florida, and it was like a Robert the Doll thing. So I friend Robert on Facebook and on Twitter, and all of a sudden Robert friends me back. <laughs> and then he starts suggesting you should like this person too and I'm going um, I'm not going to say no to Robert the Doll <laughs> so, yeah you kind of get the network in there I can see how it could happen you know you know, Lucifer gets a Facebook page and you know you really should like this person <laughs> in that work uh. I'm sorry but uh, you know if, if Lucifer looks like you know the guy on the the television uh, show. No. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, forget it. And you wow. know, he was the most beautiful of the angels and the most talented of the angels. Yeah. Uh yeah. It, yeah. Yes. Well, You're right. The band. That's yeah. what they said. Yeah. So. So. In North Carolina, uh, they had one here, or you had one here called Chicken Alley. What was that? Oh about? yeah. <laughs> Love Chicken Alley. One of, my, one of my most enjoyable uh, stories. 
right, there, there was a man here in the 1800s back when Asheville was pretty much a logging community. People logged here and, and the loggers would come off the mountains and come to Asheville to drink and party and spend their money. Well, there was a doctor here in Asheville that um, he didn't hang out with other doctors. He liked hanging out with the uh, loggers and listening to stories and drinking with them and setting up and having a really good time. Well, there was where some of the bars were, and, I, and the chickens would congregate in the alley. The wild chickens around Asheville would congregate in that alley. So you had to walk through the chickens to get to the different bars that were in that alley. Well, one night he come, he got off work, he went home, got ready to go out, he got his top hat on, he had his cane, he was in a really good mood, and he started down the alley. Well, as he come down the alley through the chickens, there was a fight broke out in one of the bars. And the new fought, they fought hard and bloody and violently and really bad. Well, the fight spilled out into the alley. Unfortunately for the doctor, he was in the alley when the fight boiled out into it, and he was killed. Well, because of that, now his spirit still walks up that alley and down that alley looking for the bar. Wow. Mm. And I've, I've seen pictures and stuff that people have snapped, and it actually looks like a shadow with a top hat and a cane. Wow. Oh, man. I mean, when you can see that kind of detail, you know, there, there's got to be, you know, something to it. Oh, yeah. I, have to do I, I don't. I don't doubt that happened one bit. Mm. Uh, uh, I guess that's what happened. Jeff, you're breaking up too. Yeah, of course. It was a good joke too. <laughs> <laughs> no, not again. I was. I was saying uh, that's what happens when plans go all foul. Oh, oh boo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Oh. Well, what what's this other one um, here from North Carolina? Uh, the Clyde Irvin ghost. Oh, the Clyde Irwin um, high school, the ghost in my high school. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, where the high, my Irwin Clyde Irwin high school sets now? It used to be a graveyard. It was holy ground. Well. The city of the city and county hired somebody to come in and move the graves, and the graves were people that were poor and indigent, and just you know, not not have any money is for poor people, and uh, they come in and supposedly move the graves. Well, they built a high school and they found you know they found a few remnants of some graves and they moved those, but when they went to build the area where the band and everything is and the amphitheater. They run the bulldozer in there and they took a big scoop of dirt up and when they lifted it up, there was bodies hanging from the bulldozer. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. So they, put them back. And they moved out and they hired another company to come in and move those graves. And now when you're a friend in high school, especially in the band area, there's shadows, there's disconnected voices, there's doors opening and closing, and just an in general feeling of something's not right. And every now and then you'll feel a cold breeze come through you. Wow. Uh, I just, that's my, did they ever... I mean, obviously, they must have relocated the rest of the graves afterwards. They did, yes. Finally. Oh, wow. Wow. If they got them all. If they got them. Yeah, I still think there's still some up there, personally. Yeah, that happens. As long as you don't go, long you don't go swimming with Joe Ben Williams. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, that happened out here in San Francisco, too. Um, they relocated most of the graveyards out of San Francisco. 
um, but somehow they managed to leave them under the um, uh, Legion of Honor and the golf course up there. Well, so, you know, golf too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had the same thing happen here in my area. Uh, two places that uh, I actually investigated. Um, they were supposed to have moved uh, the graves because they wanted to build something there. But they just, you know, like in Poltergeist, they moved the headstones, but not the graves. Sounds about right. Sounds about and right. And the next thing you know, the, the buildings that are on the property are haunted Wow. The dead don't like being disturbed. No. Nope. And it's it's Not a shame all. because those people who's bought the houses or uh, the property for business or something, uh, they got to deal with it. Oh yeah. 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 And there uh, and. In that situation, there's not a lot of way to do with it other than actually moving the bodies and having them re sanctified. Yep. And at, yeah. at that time, you probably don't even know whose body it was if, if the gravestones had already been moved. That's yeah. True. Very true. Yeah. It's hard to make it right, that's for sure. Yeah. Ick. Well, uh, George, when it comes down to. Uh, actual investigations um where has been the most haunted place that you've been to so far hmm well let's see um I just really just some old cemeteries uh some of the older cemeteries where they where they're buried but there's not even really a headstone there uh that's that sad. Hundred years old that were uh, could have been Indians killed or uh, just people dying of tuberculosis. Nobody knew who they were, so they buried them and they just put a a plain stone on the top of their grave. I mean, we've got really old old graveyards in places, and when you're there, I mean, you feel it. You feel it more than you actually see it. I've seen the full body apparitions, but I felt it when I've seen them. Mm. And it, it's like they're asking to be acknowledged so that they can go on to the other side. But there's no way to acknowledge them if they don't tell you who they are. Yeah, wow. so it's it's like a sadness? It is. And, and unless you have, fortunately, because I did pass away for a very short period of time, I do have a little bit more of a connection where I can say, Okay, this was Susie. Okay, Susie, you 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 can go on now. You can you can rest. About your what? Mm. Wow, that's probably some of the saddest things. Uh, you know, I've been to so many uh, different cemeteries. Uh, I live in between both Gettysburg and Antietam battlefields. And Ooh. I've been to both uh, cemeteries. And it just seems that whenever I've walked among those graves where the unknowns are, it's probably oh. the saddest because, because they were never identified, they are really kind of lost. And it's, it affects me more than anything else. And I'm sure that's probably because all they could put in the grave was pieces, and they had no idea from which body they were from. Yeah. Even, yeah. Or yeah. even, you know, sometimes what side right. they were from. Right. Yeah. That was two of the most bloody battles in the Civil War. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those were just nasty, nasty battles, especially in Tinum. Yeah. Sure was. And uh, I've been to both of them, so... I can't imagine. Now, really. down there in your area um, in North Carolina, uh, as far as the Civil War was concerned, have you ever encountered any Civil War spirits in your area? Uh, not enough to matter. They didn't have a lot of battles here in the mountain where I'm at. There was not a lot actually happened here. Most of it happened down towards like 
cow pens and areas like that that are flatter. Like cow pens. Yeah, here was they had a lot of gorilla fighting here because the mountains and the terrain didn't allow for a big, you know, a big area to battle in. Everything had to be close quarters all the time. Right. So right. they, yeah, you know, they didn't really do a lot of major battles like. Antietam or Gettysburg or Cowpens or anything like that here because they it was it was impossible because it was just too rough at that time. But I have I have I had a Civil War I was in a graveyard and I had a Civil War Confederate soldier uh, tap me on the shoulder. Really? Wow. A little I could see. Right, of course I could see through him. You it wasn't a full apparition. But it was almost like he was asking permission to go. Really? Oh. Wow. Got that? You just got that sadness and that feeling from him. Uh-huh. So I said, said to you know what what I felt was there. I said, yet yeah, you go home, go home where you need to be. You have permission, and then just went away. Wow. I know there's a, in the cemetery in Wilmington. Um, there's one place where. They got one big monument, and in that particular grave, there's over 550 Civil War soldiers buried in from Fort Fisher. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. Sure is. They got a big monument on top of it. That, that's amazing. It really is. I bet, that's, I bet that place just grabs you when you come through. Oh, yeah. We it's a real old cemetery you walk through and I mean just the markers and stuff it, it's really eerie uh, to see a lot of that stuff mm. and I mean even those people that don't have um, any kind of sense of the spirits when you walk amongst the graves of those that have died you know traumatically you can't help but feel it you know, it it's a matter of empathy. Oh yeah. So I'm sure that you, that you, George, you've gone to many different places, not only just uh, cemeteries, but areas where you have encountered um, the, you know, just the the spirit or the energy of those that have passed, especially traumatically. You know, that's got to affect you. It, it does. I can. I can drive down the road and, and feel where there's been accidents and people have died. I can oh dear. go wow. in different areas and, and feel the pain sometimes. And it's just, it's just really, sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, so have, have you had this all your life or was it just something that developed over time? It happened after I, I I was in my 20s, and I got pneumonia extremely bad. Uh, and they finally took me to the hospital. I wouldn't go to the hospital. I stayed home and stayed home and fought against it and fought against it. And I had 105 fever, and they finally, when I passed out and was unable to move, they took me to the hospital because wow. I couldn't fight no more. Wow. So I got to the hospital. They admitted me. They were pumping me up with all these fluids and antibiotics, and they were doing all this stuff. And I think it was the, either the first or second night that one night about, I don't know, I think like two o'clock, I, I felt comfortable. I was, I was feeling pretty good. And I woke up and there was a woman standing beside my bed, an older woman. And she said, it's okay. It's okay. So I sat up in the bed and these people started coming through the walls of my room. And over in the corner, there was a figure there, and I couldn't make it out. So I looked back, and when I stood up off the bed, my body was still on the bed. Wow. So I started looking, and for lack of a better description, I'm going to say an angel. It was a, a person in the corner, and you could see the outline of the wings and their eyes. That's all I could really see other than an outline. And these people were coming through the walls of my room, and they were talking to me. And this older lady was talking to me. We were just conversation back and forth between all of us. And it 
the one in the corner raised his hand and there was a little white dot formed and it just spread it out to like a big, like a portal. And the people started walking in that portal. And I went to walk and the woman grabbed me. She said, no, it's not, you don't, you don't need to go there right now. She said, you just need to lay back down. It's not your time. Wow. So I just sat back on the bed. I went to lay down and I looked. And she, she waved at me and smiled, and she went into the portal, and he raised his hand again, and it went away, and he disappeared. And I laid back down, and next thing I know, there's alarms going off. My door burst open. But the weirdest thing about the whole thing was when I was talking to the old lady and walking around my room, the clock, the clock in my room never changed. The second hand didn't move. Nothing changed on it at all. Hmm. But when yeah. I woke it was moving. There's people running my room, and there was a woman jumped up like she was going to give me CPR. And I asked her, "What are you doing?" And she freaked out. She didn't know what to do. Yeah. And they all kind of left the room, and one of the nurses was standing there, and I said, I "Remember her name?" Name, and that woman went just pale. The nurse did. Come to find out, that old lady, it was I had been talking to the nice old lady. She had died in the room that I was in a week before I got there. Wow. Yeah. And wow. I told every person's name that was in my room. Never one of those people had died. And oh my time. goodness. <laughs> so that's when the whole thing began. It's pretty well known that most people, would they end up. Um, experiencing uh, spirits comes from a near-death experience and that's obviously what happened to you and you you can't dismiss that no you know, there, there's so much of those things that happen to people um, and it it happened to me I mean I've seen spirits since I was a kid but it took a, a near-death experience for me to really hone in on the spirit world. How in the world do you experience, uh, you know, explain that? You you can't. And mm-hmm. those people around you that love you and uh, understand you, they believe you. And those peer, people that don't, oh, I'm sorry, it does happen. Well, if they believe in science, they can help to believe it. Because yeah. one of the theories from Einstein was a parallel universe. And yeah. that falls with that parallel universe theory. It falls within that, that realm. And I can't remember what scientist it was who expanded upon that and said for every decision a new parallel world is, is created. That's why there's an infinite number of the parallel universes. Yeah. And I that when you pass away, you actually break down one of those walls and it gives you access depending upon what you went through. It gives you so much access into that world as well. Yep. Now, I don't have, you know, the, the I'm not a medium. I don't have any of that ability. I just simply know that when there's something there that's not right, I can You're see. You're a sensitive. You're an empath. I'm, everybody says I'm insane, but I guess the impact. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, well, it, you're it, in good it, company, George. That's for darn sure. That's cool. I like y'all, so it's okay. <laughs> now, before it gets too late, um, of course, we got to talk about uh, Elvis Presley's ghost. Ooh. <laughs> the king. He has the busiest ghost I've ever read about in my life. So, <laughs> man, what? You mean walk, not George around. Washington? <laughs> he's, a, he's a busy ghost as well as still walking around alive. Yes, he's so busy. He's well, either he's in National Park or Vegas or California. He's just everywhere. <laughs> he's awful. <laughs> well, maybe we can get him to visit us on the show. 
I mean, you, you got to give him credit. You know, he, he was an incredible performer and singer and all that. And even after he's gone, he still is making appearances. I mean, they <laughs> see him constantly over at Graceland. They've got photos of his ghost over in Las Vegas, where he performed quite a bit. They've got pictures of him walking down the Sunset Strip in California. There you go, Jeff. That's yeah, that's like a few blocks from me, but I've done somewhere on Sunset Strip. That's a little farther down. <laughs> I mean, how can you not like a ghost with good hair? I mean, that's oh, I thought. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> if we can just get him to perform, we'll be good to go. Oh yeah, yeah. Take your tape recorder. Yeah, I mean, he's a it's the he's the best ghost there is out there. He can be everywhere. Yeah, like I said, he's like George Washington. He's slept here. He slept there. <laughs> I don't think he's doing too much sleeping anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he can't. He's got to have a heck of a schedule. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, wow. Now, uh, George, have you ever been to the Washington, D.C. area? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, and have there been anything there that you've, uh, you know, encountered or anything that caught your eye? Well, I was young there. When I went to Washington, D.C., was, I was in high school, so that's been a long time ago before I, I had the near-death experience. So back then I was young and, you know, a little uh, – insane so i don't really remember much back then <laughs> well i guarantee you there there's an awful lot there i i grew up i was born raised and lived and married like five minutes away from the dc line and i can okay. tell you that uh washington dc has got its fair share of uh spooks goblins and an awful lot of stuff so you know, well, definitely research that. It's it's pretty cool. They do have an awesome ghost there in Congress. Uh, <laughs> well, live or dead? Well, the dead one's one I like, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this ghost wanders the stairs of Congress. He was killed on the stairs of Congress. Wow. So he wanders he wanders around in the dark areas of the of the of the building there. Yeah. He's actually in my second book. Oh. Cool. Now, have you done um, much research, and are you planning on one for anything overseas as far as hauntings go? I love the ones overseas. They're so much more fun. They really are. Uh, I actually put seven of the overseas stories in my last book. It wow. has the uh, – uh, if I can remember all I put in there. I know I put the true story of George and the Dragon in there. Uh -huh. I did uh, the rock apes in Vietnam, which mm -hmm. were known to attack our people. Mm -hmm. did the, the, there's a story come out of France that is basically the basis for Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Of course, I did the Banshee in Ireland. You you, you got to do the Banshee. I mean, it's it's just too cool. I did a Chinese vampire. Did a golem in Israel, and I did a little people in Africa. Wow. Not the, not the big ones. Yeah. I think the Gollum was probably the most fascinating. Oh, I love the Gollum story. Absolutely fascinating what that thing is. Um, you know, when you when you look at, you know, not only it's not a reanimation, reanima but it's a, an animation of an inanimate object. Yep, a clay that does your bidding. Clay. And it was, it actually comes from it's, it's good. Yeah, creation. Oh. Yeah. Was it was George or me? Both of you. Oh. Kind of. Wait, what? You, you both had uh, mic issues. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, it's not on my end. My cats are not near me. 
Okay, Actually, try again. I had five cats in the room with me, but they're they're not they're all not on the desk. <laughs> Mine's in the bedroom of my wife. So go ahead and uh, try again now. What you was trying to say? Yeah, about oh, the golem. It comes from the Jewish mysticism. It's a Kabbalistic creation. Well, yes. the Jewish mysticism book is it's a spin-off religion from the Hebrew and it talks about like the first woman to be created wasn't Eve, it was actually Lilla. Right. And she was created Lilla. Eve yeah. that and she became very arrogant and everything else and she went to the highest peak in Eden and uh called God out by name and he cast her out to being a night demon. Wow. Yeah, Old Testament God was kind of testy. Yeah. yeah. He didn't take a lot of crap off nobody. You know, he just... <laughs> old guys. Oh. I actually have a script you'd probably find interesting in which uh, a woman is challenging a religious man's beliefs and she points out, you know, which God are you referring to? The, the genocidal Old Testament God or everything's wonderful, rainbows, New Testament God? Oh, goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> well, you know, for me, probably the golem is is one of the most frightening because it doesn't have a conscience or anything like that. You can't reason with it. And that's, you know, for something to come after you that you can't say stop, you know, don't do this. That, to me, that's that's the most eerie. Actually, it reminds me of everybody I went to school with. Yeah. Kind of single minded, you know. Wow. Yeah, exactly. I mean you 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 just can't uh you can't tell them to stop, you know, right. doing what you're doing. Uh, but anything in, in mythology, um when it comes to asking something to do something for you, I think that is probably the, the most frightening, whether it's a witch conjuring something or uh, something from voodoo conjuring something. Um, that is the most frightening because it comes from the will you yeah. know, of the person that is doing it. And yeah. if you believe that it's going to hurt you, it's going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Your your subconscious can make you hurt yourself, whether you mean to or not. Right. Yeah. And do exactly what they're wanting you to do. And exactly. And that, that's what the big driving thing for voodoo is. You know, zombies actually come from voodoo ritual. Yep. The original the original meaning of zombie was, and what they base that off of is, uh some of the drugs that they were using and it was zombify the person and they thought they were dead and then come back to life but it wasn't that they were actually just under some heavy drugs and and because their body wasn't getting oxygen and it wasn't going to their brain they had a one purpose mind that was to, to you know move forward to a kill or whatever and it didn't have anything to do with being dead and being brought back it had something to do with mind-altering drugs like bath salts to do nowadays. Right. Wow. It's ironic because one of the original uh, legends of the like Haitian zombies is if you were to feed them salt, they would remember they were dead and return to their graves. Yep. Well, actually, the, the salt is a – it does something to the, the t neurotoxin that they put in there it stops it from reacting. So actually, Clarvis Narcisse uh, had salt, uh, somehow got a hold of it, and that's what caused him to start remembering uh, where he came from. So there is basis in fact with that. Oh, yeah, very much so. Wow. Very well. Well, our time is uh, running down real fast. Uh, we got time probably for one more question, Barbara or uh, Kat. Uh, well, George, uh, I have one final question. 
Now, when it comes to um, your next book, is there anything in particular or any place in particular are you going to focus on? Well, my next book, I'm actually going to get away from the folklore. I'm going to write something from my poor brain, and I'm doing a um, paranormal horror. Paranormal horror? Yeah, this Ooh. This is set in, it's got, um, I don't know what <laughs> it's, got, it's got some spiritual stuff in it. It's got uh, this um, really blood and gore, bad ways to kill people, stop thing. One guy gets run through a, uh, a wood chipper, as an example. Ouch! Wow. Uh, Shades of Fargo. I bet that was sharp. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Wow. And okay. he probably said, well, that won't hurt mulch. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the jokes can be recycled. That's true. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, that's pretty... All right. This would be a narrative fiction novel you're talking about? It's going to be pretty wild, yeah. It's going it's to come out of my head, so Lord only knows what, how bad it's going to be. comes out. Yeah, <laughs> like like I'm a little salt shaker. Tip me over and pour me out. <laughs> I, I grew up reading science fiction and science fantasy all my life, uh, so I'm, I've got like a warped brain. Wow. <laughs> well, you're good company. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, all right. Any last uh, things, uh, Jeff, Barbara? Cat. Yeah, we're good. We really, to need to know, really need to know, learn how to expand time so we can have more time with our better guests. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are definitely a blast to talk to. That's for sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, we try to make make it uh, fun and and having a good time. So, uh, all right, listen, we're down to uh, under two minutes. I want you to give out all your information where people can follow you, uh, contact you, uh, uh, get your books and all the good stuff. And then we want you to stay on for a few minutes after we're off. All right. Well, the best way to find out anything you want to know about me and my book, you go to my website, which is author. Everything and oh, no, I sure you go to the website because I am going to do a book giveaway. Oh, cool. All right. Well, the link to his website will be on the report page because we kind of lost the, uh, oh, the yeah. .x and host aspect of the web URL. But I have links to your, your website, your Instagram, Facebook, uh, your author page on Facebook, uh, Taylor's Production, which we should really have talked about. And your IMDb entry, fellow actor. Oh, cool. I appreciate that. And links to all your books will be on the page. All right. With that, uh, our time is just about up. And I want to thank everybody for being here and listening tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. And we will see you uh, in two weeks. Next week, uh, I guess. So we'll have something. Uh, anyway, with that. Um, this is Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, Barbara Duncan, Cat Cash. And we'll see you next week at the same time. So good night, everybody. You've been listening to the Paranormal View on the Para X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of The Paranormal.